Emmett Mackin has never talked about that day until now. He tells our Amy Cavino about being trapped in a basement, the loss of loved ones, and why he's glad he was there. I've never spoken publicly about it, uh, but you know, it's 20 years ago now. It, it, it's history. It's something that you know we should remember. Uh, it's changed you know, all of our lives in this country. Emmett Mackin was 26 years old, three months out of the academy, a rookie cop in the 23rd precinct, and September 11th was supposed to be his day off. We got down there not, not long before the South Tower collapsed, so we kind of just got there. Assigned to a team with eight officers and a sergeant, as hundreds were fleeing in fear, the team ran into the danger to an underground mall where people were trapped and disoriented. And then... Lights flickered, went out, and we heard the pancaking, and the building came down on top of us. Mackin was thrown 30 feet, like a hockey puck, he says. His helmet ripped off his head, his hat ripped from his belt. I, I just remember being pelted when, when the blast happened, and, you know, I'm uh, not ashamed to say, like, I just curled up in a ball, you know, like, hoping for the best, kind of, you know, flying through the air type thing and just getting pelted with, you know, it felt like rocks and you know, like I remember like kind of whimpering. The rookie was prepared, the only one with a flashlight, but the dust was so thick, everyone was disoriented. You know, your heart sank. We're like, when are we get out of here, you know? People turn to me like, what do we do now, officer? And I'm like, you know, how, how do you tell them? <laughs> like, I, I'm three months out of the academy at the time. A stranger guided them in the right direction. Sunlight appeared. Mackin said it looked like a moonscape outside and was eerily quiet. Where the hell is everyone, you know? His first responder reflexes took over. He saw an FBI agent he knew struggling to help an injured woman and instinctively grabbed the other side of the chair. Unbeknownst to him, a photographer snapped the image. In 2019, his cousin saw the photo in the 9-11 museum. She actually uh, passed away three or four days later. <laughs> I didn't know that till uh, 2019. So it was it was a little bit of a shock to, oh. to find out, you know. He lost his cousin in the North Tower collapse and so many more. Every day you'd hear about somebody else, somebody else, somebody else. And the succession of goodbyes seemed endless. Nobody wanted uh, someone's funeral to be just attended by three or four people. So, you know. You work a 12, 13, 14 hour shift and then you go to a funeral or a memorial and then uh, you get up and you do it again, you know, and again and again and again and again. And, uh, you know, it just, it got to be a blur. You know, this is my hat from that day. That was, wow. that was found uh, a few days after. For a time, Emmett Mackin was on the missing list. Here's why. This is, uh, arrived at our precinct and I was actually marked down missing for three or four days because someone found this and it had my badge number on it. Sergeant Mackin says he's glad he was there. He wouldn't change it. He saw the best in people and was glad he could help. But being there changed him a lot. It took the good people. You know, it took the good guys. Well, you know, where's the sense in that? When terrorists attacked America, word immediately went to the president. And the person who delivered that message is a familiar face here in the Granite State. WMUR's Adam Sexton sat down with the former head of Franklin Pierce University, whose previous career included a key role in the White House. White House Chief of Staff Andy Card had the task of delivering some of the most important information ever whispered into the ear of an American president. On 9-11, President George W. Bush was at a Florida school with a group of young students. Just prior to heading into the classroom, he was informed that a plane had hit the World Trade Center. Captain Bauer came up to me and said, oh my God, another plane hit the other tower. And it was then that I performed a task the chiefs of staff have to perform all the time. Does the president need to know? Easy answer to that question, yes. What do I tell him? I decide to pass on two facts, make one editorial comment, and to do nothing to invite a dialogue or a question from the president. 
I knew that he was sitting in front of second graders, in front of a press pool, and I assumed there was a boom microphone that would be able to pick up what was said. And I walked up to the president, leaned over. He never turned to me. He did kind of <clears throat> nod one direction. I leaned over and I said, a second plane hit the second tower. America is under attack. In a high-speed ride back to Air Force One, they learned another airliner had struck the Pentagon. The door to the limousine is opened up, the president steps out. The engines on Air Force One are already running, which is a protocol no-no. So I say, Mark Tillman, the pilot of Air Force One, must really want to get out of here. So we get on the plane, we're rolling down the runway almost before the uh, door is shot on the plane. And mm. the president takes his seat, we take our seat, we get up in the air. And then Flight 93 uh, didn't happen until a little bit later when we were on the plane and the president is making phone calls. He also received a call from the vice president of the United States asking if the military had permission to shoot down commercial jetliners if they were not responding to the FAA communication to land. And I remember when the president authorized, yes, our pilots could shoot down commercial jetliners, I believe that Dick Cheney had already given that order, but anyway, that's another story. <clears throat> the president, I was impressed, hung up the phone and he leans across and talks to me. I'm sitting at the desk in the office on Air Force One, and he said, I can't believe I re just delivered that order. It was soon after that that we learned Flight 93 had crashed into the ground in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And yes, some of us on Air Force One wondered if it was shot down by one of our pilots. Card says as a storm of uncertainty raged around them, President Bush remained calm, making the immediate response to 9-11 a defining moment. I believe that's the moment he became president of the United States. He took the oath of office January 20th at noontime, you know, 2001. But I think that moment when I said America was under attack, he recognized his obligation to keep his oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. And the president was not the only person away from his office that day. Then Governor Gene Shaheen was in Washington but was on a conference call with officials here in New Hampshire when the attacks began. She recalls trying to make difficult safety decisions from a distance. It was making determinations, calls back to the state to talk about should we leave the state house open, should we close state offices. I think we were the only state house and state in New England that did not close our state house on November the 11th or September the 11th because we said um, this is what the terrorists want us to do. We are not going to change our way of life. Um, we are going to make sure that we are as safe as possible for all of the people of the state, but we're going to go about our activities as normal. Now, Senator Shaheen says that the state quickly set up a commission to analyze emergency response procedures, which led to several changes by the time she left the corner office. The Federal Aviation Center in Nashua, which controls the airspace over Boston, played a critical role in trying to intercept the hijacking on September 11th. We go back to Amy now with one air traffic controller's account of the most terrifying day of his career and why it took more than two years for him to believe he did the best job he could have that day. It's hard to believe it's been 20 years. It, you know, it, it, I still have a pretty good vision of it, you know, of what happened. I've, I've forgotten probably a few things. Colin Scoggins says he remembers what a gorgeous morning it was. He lingered out by his pool with a cup of coffee, arriving to work by about 825. As soon as I walked in the door of the FAA center, someone came up to me and said there's a hijack going on on the floor. At first, Scoggins says he deliberately stayed out of the fray, but that didn't last. News 9 obtained a recording from the National Archive of the one of the 40 or so calls Scoggins made that terrifying morning. Those tapes also captured the moment the first flight was taken over. Scoggins says the first voice is the hijacker on American Airlines Flight 11. We have some planes. Just stay quiet and you'll be okay. We are turning to the airport. American 11, are you trying to call? Nobody move. Everything will be okay. If you try to make any move, you'll danger yourself and the airplane. Just stay quiet. Then it's Scoggins on the phone with Northeast Air Defense, trying to get support from the Otis Air National Guard Base on Cape Cod. Head towards Kennedy. Uh, looks like the speed is decreasing. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where. Nobody really. Are you the controlling agency? 
Or is New York? Boston Center. Boston Center. Right now we are. We set it right for New York Center. And is there any military assistance requested? Uh, yes, we're actually trying to get uh, F-15s to... Uh, yes, you do want F-15s out? Yeah, F-15s out of Otis. Scoggins was a military liaison for the FAA and leveraged those connections when the protocol phone chain broke down and when they lost radio contact with American 11. So I got an aircraft that could be between 29 and 35,000 feet passing through the busiest probably corridor of air traffic in the world. And we got to know what altitude this guy's at. Scoggins noticed on radar the speed of the plane decreasing and calculated it must be descending. And then about, I don't know, four or five minutes later, we hear that an aircraft hit the tower. And we're like, we look, me and Danny looked at each other for a quick second like, nah, that couldn't have been American 11. It was 8.46 a.m. and then 9.03 17 minutes later, United 175 hits the second tower. I just could not believe all this was happening at one time. It, it was not a good feeling. As a controller, um, you want to be in control. Scoggins says the only lead time the military got that day was for American 11. There was simply no reaction time for the other three planes. They didn't know anything about United 175. They didn't know anything about American 77 until after it hit the Pentagon. And they didn't know anything about United 93 until it was already in the ground. It would be two years before Scoggins had real validation about the role he played that day. He urged the Justice Department to obtain missing tapes from New Hampshire Air Command and play them during the interview. After hearing that, I had to go sit out by the pool and <clears throat> had a couple beers and I finally felt relieved. I felt like I did my job. Scoggins says he's always been a patriot and 9-11 cemented that for perpetuity. I think you saw the best of a lot of people come out. So bad for the country for what we went through, but at the same time, it showed people what we're really made of. Among the first people to jump into action were service members. New Hampshire's Air National Guard was responsible for refueling the fighter jets sent to patrol New York that day. And one little girl in the Lakes region provided an image that summed up America's response to the tragedy. What she's telling her daughter 20 years later.